With the bombers at 16,000 feet and my own group 1,500 feet higher, we crossed the Owen Stanley Range. Moresby slid into view. The seven zeros closest to the bombers suddenly broke their projecting weave and wheeled around in a tight climbing turn, still bunched together. P-40s, dropping from higher altitude to hit the bombers, had been seen too soon, and the wedge of climbing zeros split their ranks, spilling the fighters away from the lumbering heavyweights. The seven fighters returned to their original position. Angry blossoms of flame and black smoke burst into being below the bombers. The flak was some 1,500 feet low. However, the bursts were a roaring sign of danger. Immediately, we broke formation and rolled frantically to escape. Barely in time, a second flak barrage exploded thunderously above us, but not close enough to damage our planes. Even as we rolled back into formation, the bombers and their fighter escorts were clawing in a maximum power climb. We knew the third flak barrage would have caught the bombers dead centre if they had maintained their original course. And there it was, exactly where the bombers would have been, the violent cracking sounds of the anti-aircraft shells materialising out of nowhere. For some unknown reason, the Americans refused to alter the change of range settings for their anti-aircraft shells. They followed a pattern we could anticipate almost exactly, so precise was their battery range setting formula, and so unchanging its use that evading the American flak at high altitude was almost no problem. The bombers passed over Moresby and swung into their wide, slow turns, coming back this time for their bombing run, the sun now behind the pilots and the bombardiers. Hardly had the bombers slipped into their target runs when six fighters came at us from high altitude. I hauled back on the stick, standing the zero on its tail. The other five fighters were glued to me as we turned directly into the enemy attack. We had no chance to fire. The enemy fighters rolled away and scattered, still diving. We returned to our escort weave positions, but only two fighters slipped into their wingman positions. Miyazaki and his other two fighters had apparently gone crazy. They were swerving down, below the bombers. I had no time to worry about Miyazaki. The enemy flak was trying to find the range, and a snarl of shells thundered 1,500 feet below the bombers. They could not evade the shells this time. They were on their runs, and the bombardiers held every plane tightly in place. I kicked the rudder bar and skidded away from the expected barrage. Then the bombers were gone, hidden completely by a series of bursting shells which spewed out thick smoke. For a moment, it looked as though the shells had struck dead centre, but then, miraculously, it seemed the seven planes emerged in formation from the boiling smoke. Their bays were open and the black missiles tumbled through the air. I watched them curve, picking up speed. They erupted in fountains of smoke, the blast waves from each bomb bursting outward in a flash of light as it struck. Their bellies empty, the bombers picked up speed amid the continual bursts of flak, then wheeled hard over to the left. Miyazaki was flying some 1,500 feet below the bombers. He was in a fantastic position. Without radio, they had been ripped out to increase our range. I could not call him to return to position, and we dared not leave the bombers unprotected. We passed Moresby and the bursting flak fell behind. I sighed with relief, too soon. Nearly a mile above us, a single P-40 fighter dove with incredible speed. He came down so fast I could not move a muscle. One second he was above us, the next the lone plane plummeted like lightning into the bombers. Six hundred yards in front of me, I watched the fighter. He was going to ram. How that plane ever got through the few yards clearance between the third and fourth bombers of the left echelon, I shall never know. It seemed impossible, but it happened. With all guns blazing, the P-40 ripped through the bomber formation and poured a river of lead into Miyazaki's plane. Instantly, the Zero burst into flames. With tremendous speed, the P-40 disappeared far below us. Miyazaki's plane drifted slowly down. Trailing flame, brilliant fire flared out, and an explosion tore the Zero into tiny pieces of wreckage. We failed to see even a piece of metal falling, Everything had happened in three or four seconds. We maintained our course for home. Over Buna, our fighters broke, abandoned their roles as escort, and turned for lie. Miyazaki's loss was a painful lesson to all of us. 
I am firmly convinced that in those early days of the war, the individual skill of our pilots was definitely superior to that of the men flying the Dutch, Australian and American fighters. Our training, which was conducted in pre-war Japan, was more meticulous than that of any other nation. Flying meant everything to us, and we spared no effort to learn every aspect of air-to-air -air combat. And of course, we flew a fighter superior in most respects to those of the enemy. In the air battles of World War II, however, individual skill was not enough to ensure continued survival. There were many instances, of course, when planes met in individual dogfights, and a pilot's prowess gave him victory. This was not, however, the general rule, but the exception. Our greatest failing in aerial combat lay in the fact that we lacked teamwork, a skill, unfortunately, which the Americans developed so thoroughly as the war went on. Miyazaki's loss, as well as that of three other Zero pilots shot down early in April, I can attribute only to the inability of our fighter pilots to function as a closely knit team. When encountering enemy fighters, our pilots were more apt to scramble in all directions for a wild free-for-all, one plane against another, much as in the days of World War I. To the Japanese pilots of the late 30s, the most valued quality of a fighter plane was its ability to cut inside an enemy fighter's turn. Maneuverability was desirable above all other characteristics, and it worked well under certain conditions and for a certain time. But the value of the individual dogfight technique evaporated when the enemy refused to fight your own kind of battle, or when his tenacious adherence to a preconceived plan reduced the effectiveness of the lone wolf attack. Two days after Miyazaki's death, seven B-26 bombers attacked Lai. Fortunately, we received sufficient advance warning and had nine fighters in the air to meet the planes as they stormed in at a height of only 1,500 feet. For an hour we fought a bitter running battle with the marauders. In the end, only one bomber went down, with another fleeing as a cripple. It was the clumsiest air fight I had ever seen. The nine zeros lacked organisation. Instead of making concerted attacks against one or two planes, and using massed firepower to cut the B-26s apart, our pilots were overzealous and threw themselves all over the sky. Repeatedly, several planes jerked frantically out of their firing passes to avoid a collision with another Zero, or to evade the fire of a friendly fighter. It was incredible that none of our planes rammed into another or shot any of us down. I fairly exploded in anger back at Lay. I jumped from the Zero's cockpit, brushing aside my ground crew, and shouted at every pilot to stand and listen. For perhaps fifteen minutes I cursed their clumsy stupidity pointing out to each man his, pointing out to each man his errors, and stressing the unpleasant fact that only a miracle had brought them all back to lay alive. From that night on, we held sessions every evening to improve our teamwork. These classes continued for the first week during a strange and unexpected lull in the air war. On April 23rd, Nishizawa, Ota and I made a reconnaissance flight to Kairuku, a new enemy base north of Moresby shooting up and burning several carrier planes on the airstrip. We had been ordered to carry out only a reconnaissance mission, but the temptation was too much, especially after our recent poor showings in the air. Our report brought us orders to launch a 15-plane strafing attack on the following day. We swooped down on six B-26 bombers, 15 P-40s and one P-39, all of which seemed to be evacuating the field. We tallied two bombers and six P-40s as definite kills, with a probable for the P-39. After the one-sided air battle, we continued up to Moresby, strafing and burning one anchored PBY. Perhaps my emphasis on teamwork was the fault, especially since I rode close herd on the other fighters, but I ended the day without being able to claim a single plane. Neither could Nishizawa. To his great disgust, the next day we returned to Moresby. Despite their heavy losses in the one-sided fight of the previous day, the enemy put up stiff resistance. Seven P-40s challenged our fifteen fighters. Before the wild melee was over, six enemy fighters plunged earthward in flames. We suffered no losses, and with the air cleared, strafed Moresby and Kairuku, burning five B-26 and two P-40s. Apparently our new attempt to achieve teamwork was effective. However, it failed to benefit me or Nishizawa. 
After two consecutive battles in which the other pilots scored heavily, we returned unable to claim a single kill. We argued late into the night in an attempt to analyse each other's actions in the air, to try to discover what we were doing wrong. Everything seemed all right, but the cold fact of the matter was that we were not getting our bullets home. Another air battle followed on the 26th. Again, I returned scoreless. Again, Nishizawa was unable to claim a single victory. Although three of seven P-40s had gone down, Nishizawa was baffled. Ignoring his rangefinder, he had clung grimly to a P-40, whose pilot was frantically trying to elude the Zero glued to his tail. At point-blank range, Nishizawa, chasing the P-40 all over the sky, poured bullets and cannon shells into the enemy fighter. The latter nevertheless escaped. April 29th was Emperor Hirohito's birthday, and our commander planned a modest celebration in honour of the special event. All sailors with any cooking experience joined the kitchen staff and prepared the best possible breakfast from the limited supplies available. The Allies had made almost no effort to attack Lei in the preceding few days. This lull in battle, plus our feeling of well-being on this special occasion, threw us off guard, as the enemy had probably hoped it would. We were just finishing our morning meal at seven o'clock when sentries screamed, Enemy planes! Immediately a blaring, discordant sound shattered the morning stillness. Buckets, drums, hollow logs and the like were struck as warning signals. Two bugles blew shrilly to add to the racket, our air raid warning system. We raced for the runway too late. The bombs had already fallen and done their work. We looked up to see our old friends, the B-17s. Three of them cruised at 20,000 feet. They dropped only a few bombs, but considering their great height, with as excellent accuracy as I have ever witnessed, five zeros lay in flaming wreckage. Four others were seriously damaged, riddled, throughout with jagged bomb splinters. Of the six standby fighters, only two were in flying condition. Ota and one other pilot reached the planes first. In seconds they had gunned their motors and were racing down the runway. By the time the rest of us reached our planes, it was too late to take off. The three B-17s and the two Zeros were out of sight, and, with their amazing speed, the B-17s were beyond our reach. The time passed slowly, and we cursed the bombers and fretted over Ota's return. An hour later, a single Zero dropped in for a landing. It was Endo we attacked while climbing, he explained, and worked over the B-17s as much as possible. Ota crippled one bomber and was still shooting up the airplane when my ammunition ran out, so I left for home. Another hour passed without Ota. We were worried about his safe return. Ota, the friend of one and all, the brilliant pilot, attacking at least two heavily armed B-17s alone. Endo became frantic and mumbled morosely about having left Ota because of his lack of ammunition. Fifteen minutes more went by, then Captain Saito stuck his head out of the command post and shouted joyously to us, Hey, he's safe, Ota just called from Salamawa. He got one fortress, definitely. He landed for fuel. He'll be home soon. Wonderful news. But there was still unfinished business at hand. Six flyers, including Nishizawa and myself, were selected to return the Emperor's birthday greetings to Moresby. We would have felt better had there been sixteen zeros, but our six fighters were the only machines fit for combat. The enemy undoubtedly expected a reprisal for his attack against Lei. To forestall running into a storm of waiting anti-aircraft fire, we cleared the mountain ridge at 16,000 feet, and then, instead of continuing toward Moresby at high altitude, dove immediately once we were past the crest. We flew a steep triangle, hitting its top point as we cleared the mountain range, and then diving steeply at the enemy airbase. It was perfect. The enemy timing was thrown off completely. No one expected us to attack in this new fashion. We hit the field in a wide sweep just above the ground. Dozens of maintenance men were crowded around bombers and fighters, which appeared ready for takeoff. That meant full fuel tanks and bomb bays, made to order for the surprise strafing run. They were like sitting ducks, and we sprayed bullets and shells down the runway. I could see the men on the ground staring at us in amazement, hardly believing their eyes. 
Six zeros out of nowhere. The initial pass was perfect. Not a gun had been fired at us. At the end of the runway, with the surprised gun batteries still silent, we pulled up into a steep turn and dove immediately for another run. The view on the way back was excellent. Three fighters and a bomber were burning fiercely. This time we worked over another row of aircraft, parked neatly in a long line. We hadn't expected this kind of cooperation. Again we fired in a long, running pass, strafing the enemy planes. We hit four bombers and fighters. Although none burned, men ran frantically in all directions as we screamed down for our second strafing run, and dozens remained on the ground, riddled by our bullets. We made three passes in all and then raced away at high speed. Not until we were on our way out of the area did the first anti-aircraft gun open up. I grinned. Let them waste their ammunition. But at 5.30am, the next morning, the enemy repaid us with a visit of his own with three marauders, coming in low and fast, no higher than 600 feet. The earth shook and heaved as the B-26s dumped their bombs directly onto the airstrip. As the smoke cleared, we saw five of our standby fighters tearing for altitude. They were hardly off the ground when the enemy raiders turned and came back again, thundering over the field before the fighters could close with them. Then they were gone, disappearing into the breaking dawn they had done well. One zero burned brightly, and another was smashed wreckage. Four other fighters and a bomber were badly holed with bullets and bomb fragments. For the next several days the tempo of the air war increased furiously. The Allies returned our next strafing attack with a beautifully executed run by 12 P-39s against our airfield, and heavily damaged nine bombers and three fighters. We caught the Aracobras on their withdrawal and shot down two without losses on our part. But again, neither Nishizawa nor I was able to bring down a plane. I broke out of my slump as did Nishizawa the day after the strafing attack by the P-39s. Nine of us flew to Moresby, spoiling for a fight. We got one. Nine enemy fighters, P-39s and P-40s, waited for us over the enemy airstrip, willing to fight. Hardly were we in sight when they broke off their circle and roared head-on against our planes. I took on the first enemy fighter. The P-40 rolled into a turn as he came at me, hoping for a belly shot. I cut sharply inside him and fired. I could not have timed it better. The P-40 staggered into the burst. Instantly the enemy pilot snapped over in a left roll, but he was already too late. Another burst and the fighter exploded in flames. But he had friends and I jerked out of my turn as a P-39 dove on me. No need to run for it. I drew a split S, and the enemy pilot walked right into the trap. For a moment his belly hung before my guns as he tried to loop away. I needed only that moment, and I squeezed the cannon trigger, the shells caught the enemy fighter while it was still pulling up, and the plane fell apart in the air. He was sure I knew to have a wingman, and even as I fired my burst, I had the stick hard back and the rudder bar all the way down, horsing the zero back into the tightest turn I could make. It worked. I came out in line for a quick burst. The startled pilot tried to disengage by diving, but too late. I rolled out of the turn in time to snap out another burst. The enemy fighter flew directly into my fire, staggered, then plunged in a dive. I shouted with joy. I was out of the slump. Three fighters in less than fifteen seconds, my first triple play. The fight was over, and I had scored the only kills. Six enemy fighters fled in wild power dives, too fast for our fighters to catch up, although Nishizawa and the seven other Zeros were attempting to do so. It was impossible. The American P-39s and P-40s could always escape us by diving. Back at the lay airstrip, my mechanics came running to me excitedly. They were amazed to find that I had fired only 610 rounds of ammunition during the day's air battle, an average of just over 200 rounds for each enemy fighter. Nishizawa climbed from his plane with his face black with angry disappointment. The next day, May 2nd, we flew back to Moresby with a force of eight zeros. Thirteen enemy fighters waited for us, cruising slowly at 18,000 feet. Nishizawa spotted them first and jumped the gun. We followed his lead as he swung around in a wide turn, coming up to the enemy formation from their left and rear. 
What was the matter with these pilots? Didn't they ever look all about them? We hit the thirteen planes before they even knew we were in the air. Before they could roll away in evasive action, several enemy fighters were falling in flames. Our total bag for the day came to eight P-39s and P-40s, of which I claimed two. Nishizawa leaped from his cockpit as the Zero came to a stop. We were startled. Usually he climbed down slowly. Today, however, he stretched luxuriously, raised both arms above his head, and shrieked, Yee! We stared in stupefaction. This was completely out of character. Then Nishizawa grinned and walked away. His smiling mechanic told us why. He stood before the fighter and held up three fingers. Nishizawa was back in form. On May 7th, after several days of rest back at Rabaul, I flew in what I called a dream sweep. Four zeros were ordered out for reconnaissance over Moresby, and when each pilot saw who his wingmates were, he shouted happily. We were the wing's leading aces. I had 22 planes to my credit. Nishizawa had 13. Ota now had 11 and Takatsuka trailed us with nine. Our four best aces, what a day to mix it up with the enemy. We knew we could count on each other to cover anyone in trouble, and certainly any enemy fighter pilots wouldn't know they were flying into the worst hornet's nest possible. I hoped we'd run into opposition today. We found them. We were circling over Moresby when Nishizawa rocked his wings in signal and pointed at ten fighters in a long column, coming at us from the sea about thousand feet higher than our group. Nishizawa and Ota formed a wedge of two planes, with Takatsuka and myself immediately behind and a little lower. Four P-40s separated from the enemy formation and dove at us. All four zeros nosed up in a rapid, almost vertical climb. Instead of rolling away and scattering as the enemy pilots expected, the first P-40 went up in a wild loop, trying to get away from his own trap. The belly flashed in front of me and I snapped out a burst. The shells caught him and tore a wing off. I came out of the climb in an Immelman and saw each Zero hammering away at a P-40. All burst into flames. The remaining six fighters were on us. We scattered to the right and left, coming up in tight loops and arcing over. It worked. All of us came out with a fighter beneath us. Three more P-40s disintegrated and burned. One escaped. The three remaining fighters stuck their noses down and ran for it. On May 8 and 9, I destroyed two more enemy fighters, a P-39 and a P-40, in sweeps over Morrisby. On the 10th, I shot down a P-39 with a record low, consumption of ammunition only four cannon shells. It was the best shooting I had ever done, and the lowest number of ammunition rounds ever required to destroy an enemy plane. I was flying over the Coral Sea with Honda and Yonakawa as my wingmen. After some fifteen minutes of patrolling, we noticed a lone Era Cobra flying about three thousand feet over our fighters, cruising slowly. The pilot seemed oblivious to everything. He maintained his course as we approached from behind and below. I kept gaining altitude from directly beneath his belly, where the pilot was completely blind unless taking evasive action in a deliberate search for other planes. Honda and Yonakawa were about 200 yards below me, flying cover position, incredibly. The P-39 allowed me to close in. He had not the slightest idea that I was coming up on him. I kept narrowing the distance until I was less than 20 yards beneath the enemy fighter. He still had no idea I was there. The opportunity was too good to waste. I snapped several pictures with my Leica. My speedometer showed 130 knots, and I marked this figure down as the cruising speed for the P-39. The amazing formation flight of my Zero and the P-39 continued, with Honda and Yonikawa sliding up to catch the Aero Cobra. If he should catch sight of me and dive, I climbed slowly until I was off to the right and slightly below the enemy plane. I could see the pilot clearly, and I still could not understand his stupidity in not searching the sky around him, he was a big man, wearing a white cap. I studied him for several seconds, then dropped below his fighter. I aimed carefully before firing, and then jabbed lightly for a moment on the cannon trigger. There was a cough, 
and I discovered later two shells from each weapon burst out. I saw two quick explosions along the bottom of the P-39's right wing, and two others in the centre of the fuselage. The P-39 broke in two, the two fuselage halves tumbled crazily as they fell, then disintegrated into smaller pieces. The pilot did not bail out. Several weeks at Ley taught me a new respect for the luxury of sleep. Life at the airdrome was reduced to its simplest terms. During the day we either flew fighter missions or waited on standby alert. At night we wished only to sleep. The enemy, however, had other ideas about the matter, and almost unfailingly his bombers punctured the darkness to string rows of bombs against the field and to send ribbons of tracers into the ground as they passed over at low height. We could dispense with the foods we desired most, live in shacks and fly from a primitive field, but we could not go without sleep. And the Americans and Australians exerted every effort to keep us awake at night. It became so bad that often we abandoned our billets. Pilots went out to the runway after dark and slept in the craters dug that same night by enemy bombs, our theory, afforded substance by an overwhelming desire to sleep, was that there was little probability of an enemy bomb streaking exactly where one had fallen previously. I have no concept of the law of probabilities involved, but I do know that less than six pilots were killed in enemy night attacks during our entire tour of duty at Ley. The constant attacks, almost daily flying and primitive living conditions reduced tempers to hair-trigger status. Nothing less than the most exemplary conduct on the part of our officers prevented serious friction among the pilots, and this I consider the most remarkable fact of all at our jungle outpost. Our base commander, Captain Masahisa Saito, was a samurai officer who maintained about himself an air of reserve and dignity, sharply different from that of the attention-demanding caste-conscious army officers who surrounded General Hideki Tojo at Tokyo. Quiet yet authoritative, Saito was regarded with devoted respect by all his men. He was careful always to be the last man to enter shelter when enemy bombers attacked Lei. Despite the sluggishness of some of us, we never failed to see Captain Saito waiting sometimes impatiently, if the bombs were already exploding, for a pilot to come scrambling to the dugout. The captain would walk slowly from his billet or the command post to the shelter trenches, look up at the skies, and scan the field to see that all of his men had taken cover. And only then would he himself seek protection. Needless to say, this action had a wonderful effect on his subordinates. It is one of those unexplainable things, but this brave officer survived the war without suffering a wound. But the most unforgettable man of my combat life was Lieutenant Junichi Sasai, my direct superior, who led perhaps Japan's strongest fighter squadron. Under Sasai's command were four of Japan's leading aces Nishizawa, Ota, Takatsuka and myself. It is no exaggeration to say that every man who flew with Sasai would not have hesitated even a moment to die in defence of the young lieutenant. I have recounted how his personal intervention aided me so greatly during the unpleasant voyage from Bali to Rabul. More than once I wondered at the time about his presence and felt inclined to believe it was a hallucination. It was not only unprecedented, but unthinkable, that a squadron commander should reduce himself to the status of an orderly to attend a man at his sickbed. And yet, this was what Sasai did. Twenty-seven years old and unmarried. Sasai kept in his billet an image of Yoshitsun, the legendary Japanese war hero. Sasai disdained the demands of the naval caste system, and paid no more attention to the appearance of his clothes than any of the other pilots. Again, this may seem a small point upon which to dwell, but it was a mountainous matter in the Japanese officer code. After our arrival at Lei, I was amazed to witness Sasai's intimate interest in the welfare and health of his pilots. When a man was stricken with malaria or other tropical disease, including the vicious fungi which rotted away a man's flesh, Sasai was the first to be at his side, tending him, soothing him, and raising incredible hell with the hospital orderlies to assure his pilots continued and constant ministrations. In order to help his men, he exposed himself without flinching to some of the worst diseases man has ever known. To us he became almost legendary, 
Men who did not hesitate to kill and who lusted for battle wept shamelessly when they witnessed Sasai's deeds and pledged eternal loyalty to the young officer. One night we watched in wonder as Sasai entered the hospital to go to the side of a pilot stricken with a fungus which was eating painfully at his flesh. Nobody knew whether or not the disease was communicable, only that it was horrible. Yet it was Sasai who tended the unfortunate, it was Sasai who forfeited sleep, it was Sasai who comforted. And all this was done in defiance of what was probably the strictest military caste system in the world, where a breach of that caste by a subordinate could result in discipline justified in the mind of the superior officer by brutal beating or even by death. Even here at Ley, barely more than a jungle outpost, the hierarchy system was strictly maintained. It was unthinkable that there should be a breach of respect, no matter how slight, to an officer. Sasai especially would have had just cause to fall back upon this caste distinction if he so wished, for he was a graduate of Eitajima, Japan's Annapolis. Perhaps the other officers objected. I do not know, but Sasai often forfeited the more comfortable accommodations of the officer's billet, with its lesser crowding, and spent much of his time with us. He took every precaution to assure our health, one of the medical requirements at Ley, was that we take quinine pills every other day for protection against malaria. Because of their bitter taste, these were unpalatable to the pilots. Sasai treated the men almost like children when he discovered them, ignoring their quinine doses. He would take several of the bitter pills in his mouth, chew them and lick his lips. The average man could not refrain from spitting these out violently, but not Sasai. No man who watched his own squadron commander go through this routine would dare to complain of the quinine's bitterness. When I was alone with Sasai, I expressed my wonder at his ability to eat the quinine in this extraordinary fashion. Don't take me for a hypocrite, Sasai explained quietly. I hate them just as badly as anyone, but my men must be kept from malaria, actually. I'm doing for them exactly what my mother did for me when I was ill as a child. In our many conversations, Sasai told me of his childhood, of years of illness, of being bedridden. He told me with some embarrassment of whimpering at having to take medicine, of how his mother would pretend she enjoyed the medicine her sickly youngster needed in order to live. Because of his mother's years of devotion, Sasai's health gradually improved. He made an intense effort to build his weakened body, often suffering great pain to gain stamina. In high school, he lost his sickly appearance and finally became a judo champion. In the Naval Academy and at the Flyers' School, Sasai had stood out as a leading student and in athletics. As the months passed at Ley and the air battles grew in intensity, our supplies gradually diminished. Despite the excellent fighting record of our own wing of Zero fighters, we found it impossible to pin down the Allies. They appeared in ever-growing numbers in the air, Coupled with their always persistent aggressiveness, they proved a formidable force, indeed. Their fighters and bombers prowled over the islands and ocean area by day and by night, smashing at our supply ships in devastating attacks. American submarines also took a fearful toll. As a result, our navy was forced to hide its ships by day and resort to the cloak of darkness to move its supplies. But such movements were always inadequate, and even the trickle of supplies delivered by surface shipping fell off. In desperation, the Navy commandeered its submarines to deliver supplies to us. This was at best a compromise with necessity, for the submarines were severely limited in their capacity. Eventually we were reduced to shipments of only the most critical goods needed to continue fighting. As a result, even the few luxuries we had were reduced to the barest minimum. Beer or cigarettes were coveted by the men, and even these were never issued except as a reward when our pilots scored great victories in the air without loss to our own forces. The majority of the pilots did not drink. Cigarettes, however, were in great demand to meet the needs of many men who were inveterate smokers. What galled the men was that the flying personnel were denied cigarettes except on occasions of registering a severe defeat upon the enemy in air combat. This did not, however, deter the officers from following their caste system and issuing daily to the non-flying officer personnel a regular cigarette ration. We cursed the administration officers, 
Men who never flew, who smoked freely while the combat pilots, because of their enlisted status, could not do the same. Captain Saito normally inspected the enlisted pilots' billets once every two weeks. On these inspections, he always managed to forget his cigarette case on a desk or bunk. Nishizawa gratefully helped himself to about half of the base commander's supply from the case and then distributed his find to the other pilots. But Saito did not come very often. Finally, I lost patience and took a desperate chance. I sent my men to the native community with orders to buy native cigars. We were strictly forbidden to smoke the local tobacco for fear that it might contain narcotics. With a package of the evil-smelling cheroots, I summoned the other pilots to a far corner of the airfield. They looked at me in astonishment, hesitating to risk the wrath of higher authority by disobeying direct orders. I'll take full responsibility for these cigars, and you smoke them, I told the group. Without a word, each man took a cigar from me as I passed among them. We all lit up. I knew that when an officer sighted our group clustered together, he would come over, and within fifteen minutes Lieutenant Sasai ran up to us with astonishment on his face. One look at the cigars was enough. What are you doing? Have you all gone crazy? he shouted. Throw those things away. Several of the men flushed with embarrassment at the unusual tone from Sasai and hurled their cigars on the ground. Nishizawa and I refused to do so and remained smoking. Sasai's eyes opened wide at this refusal to obey orders. What's the matter with you two? he asked. You know that smoking those things is against regulations. His questions was what I had hoped for. I took a deep breath and told Sasai exactly what I thought of the system which denied the combat pilots tobacco, but permitted officers who never subjected themselves to enemy guns to smoke freely. I rambled on for a while telling Sasai whatever punishment he could give me was worth the smoking. Nishizawa stood by my side, silent as usual, puffing great clouds of smoke. Sasai bit his lips in anger and his face clouded. Another officer would not have hesitated to kick me as hard as he could. I turned away from Sasai guilty at having treated this fine officer in such a shameful fashion, but went right back to smoking again. The other pilots stared at Nishizawa and me in wonder. They had never seen or even heard of an officer being defied so brazenly before. Sasai disappeared. Several minutes later we saw the lone airbase sedan trailing a cloud of dust as it bore down upon our group with breakneck speed. The vehicle braked screechingly to a halt. Sasai angrily flung the door open, dragging two large duffel bags behind him. He did not say a word as he opened the tops of the two bags, each bulging with packs of cigarettes. Take these and divide them among yourselves, he said, and don't ask any questions as to where they came from. He looked out the car window as he drove off, and throw those damned cigars away, he shouted. We called Sasai the Flying Tiger. This name had nothing to do with the American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers, in China. Lieutenant Sasai always wore a belt with a large silver buckle on which was engraved the picture of a roaring tiger. Sasai's father, a retired Navy captain, had made three buckles before the war and presented one to Sasai, his only son, and one to each of the husbands of his two daughters, both naval lieutenant commanders. According to Japanese legend, a tiger goes out for 1,000 miles to prowl on his hunt and always returns from his adventure. This was the significance of Sasai's engraved buckle. Sasai was a talented pilot, but during April and early May he accounted for few victories in the air, a failure stemming directly from his lack of combat experience. Nishizawa, Ota, Takatsuka and I were determined to see to it that Sasai emerged from his cocoon and blossomed into a full-fledged ace. We took special pains to teach the lieutenant the fine points of aerial combat. We spent many a long hour in our billets explaining the mistakes to avoid in the air and the means to assure a kill. Sasai especially had difficulty with adjusting his rangefinder during a dogfight, and repeatedly we went through mock battles to help him to overcome this deficiency. On May 12th we found the opportunity to test the results of our instructions. 
Sasai responded perfectly by scoring in a breathless diving and zooming sweep which took less than 20 seconds, three victories unassisted. We were flying near Moresby in our regular morning patrol of 15 zeros in five V formations, when I sighted three Aerocobras about a mile to our right and 1,500 feet below us. Their formation was unusual. The three fighters flew in a column with about 200 yards distance between each plane. I pulled along Sasai's plane and pointed out the enemy feeders. He nodded, and I gestured for him to go ahead and make the attack. He wavered his hand and grinned, and we followed as he turned sharply to the right and dove. He hit the first Aerocobra in a perfect firing pass. His zero pounced on the unsuspecting enemy plane from above and behind. He rolled to the right and fired his cannon as he closed in. His aim was excellent. The Aerocobra burst into flames and fell apart in the air. Sasai pulled out of his dive and hauled back in a steep climb, rolling out 1,500 feet above and to the left of the second fighter. It seemed incredible, but the P-39 pilot maintained his original course. From his point of vantage, Sasai dove, rolled to the right to adjust his firing course, and raked the P-39 from tail to nose. The fighter lurched, skidded into a wild spin, and plunged for the earth. The pilot failed to get out, probably dead from the cannon shells. Sasai continued his attack in the same manner, climbing steeply and rolling over for the third attack, but the last pilot was not to be caught so easily. Even as Sasai began rolling to the right, the P-39's nose lifted steeply as the pilot began a loop, but too late, the plane was hauled up in the beginning of the loop when Sasai poured a stream of cannon shells into the fuselage and left wing. It was too much for the American plane, at the moment already under tremendous pressure from the loop. The left wing tore loose and instantly the plane whipped into a flat spin, trapping the pilot. Even I was astonished. Nishizawa grinned broadly at me from his cockpit as we rejoined the formation. Sasai was now an ace with his perfect one, two, three. Sasai's lessons for the day were not over, but it was a different and more harrowing one he was about to learn. On the return to Lei, Sasai's fighter trio moved nearly two miles ahead of the main formation. I was so pleased with the lieutenant's new status as an ace that I failed to pay attention to the widening gulf of his V-flight, a failure which had almost fatal consequences. We were crossing the Owen Stanley range, Sasai's fighters well ahead of us, when a lone error cobra plunged like an arrow from a high cloud layer directly at the unsuspecting zeros, never did I regret our lack of radios as much as I did at that moment. There was no way to warn Sasai. Despite my speed of almost 300 knots with the engine on maximum overboost, I could not reach the P-39 in time to draw him off. Fortunately for Sasai, the enemy pilot did not make his attack from above. Instead, he chose the submarine approach, diving below and behind the other fighters, then pulling up in a rapid zoom and firing from below. I was less than 800 yards away when the P-39 hauled up in a screaming climb to hit Sasai from below. In desperation, I jammed down on the cannon trigger, hoping the report would warn Sasai or possibly alarm the enemy pilot into breaking off his attack. The P-39 did not waver, but Sasai finally heard the cannon reports immediately. With his wingmen hugging his own plane, he pulled up in a loop, swinging wide in a bid for height. That was enough for the enemy pilot, with three zeros in front of him and more coming up behind. He realised the danger of being trapped. The P-39 started looping over from his climb, ready to dive as he came out, but the initiative now was mine. I went down in a turning dive, prepared to catch the Aerocobra just as it rolled out and started to race for the earth. The pilot, however, saw me and jerked over wildly in a left roll, then dove. The towering mountains blocked his path, and even as he started to pull away from my plane, he was forced to pull up. The pilot was good. He whipped down the mountainside, turning and banking sharply as he just missed the crags and slopes, with me on his tail. Every time he turned, I cut inside the turn and narrowed the distance between our two planes. And every time the P-39 saw a chance to wing away to the right or left, he faced another zero, my wingmen, good men. 
We had the Ira Cobra boxed. He would have to fight, and he did. More than once he came around in a wicked turn as he banked to avoid the mountain, firing as he closed in. Every time he did so, I turned a little shorter, looped a little closer, and brought the firing range down. I caught him at a distance of 150 yards, firing in short bursts, closing in to less than 50 yards. The P-39 spit black smoke and hurtled into the jungle. It was a shame-faced Lieutenant Sasai who came up to my plane back at Ley. My mechanics were examining with wide eyes the bullet holes in my wings when Sasai came up to stammer his thanks. He looked at the punctured metal and said no more. During the period from May 1st through the 12th, our Lai Wing emerged without a single loss from every clash with the enemy. We had taken good advantage of the enemy pilots' failures to remain alert when airborne, and excellent tactics on the part of our formations chalked up an imposing string of one-sided victories. On May 13th, the damage suffered by my own fighter grounded me for the day. It gave me the opportunity to catch up on a month's mail delivered only that morning by submarine. My mother wrote that my brothers were now sharing Japan's battles. One had volunteered for the Navy Flyers School, but failed to meet their rigid requirements and had instead enlisted at the Sasebo Naval Base. My other brother was drafted into the army and already was on his way to China. He never came home. He was later transferred to Burma and was there killed in action. But the most eagerly awaited mail was, of course, from Fujiko, she wrote at length of the great changes which were occurring at home, and surprised me with the news that she was now working in her uncle's company, which had been converted into a munitions factory. Nowadays not one person should stay idle, the Prime Minister has said. He has told the country that even daughters, if they remain home without contributing to the war effort, will be drafted and sent to any munitions plant where their services are needed. So my uncle, in order to keep me with the family, hired me at once to work for him. I was amazed to realise that Fujiko, the daughter of such an eminent family, had to work in a munitions factory. It was hard to conceive of my mother's small farm without the help of my two brothers, and she had been forced to labour and found it difficult even when we were home to help. My cousin Hatsuyo had even more disturbing news. She wrote that her father had been transferred back to Tokyo from Shikoku. Several days after her return to the city, she witnessed the April 18th attack on Tokyo by American B-25 bombers. I know that you are in the thick of combat, she wrote, and your successes against the enemy are of great comfort to all of us at home. The bombing of Tokyo and several other cities has brought about a tremendous change in the attitude of our people toward the war. Now things are different. The bombs have dropped here on our homes. It does not seem any more that there is such a great difference between the battlefront and the home front. I know that I, as well as the other girls, will work all the harder to do our share at home to support you and the other pilots who are so far away from Japan. Hatsuyo was still in school, but her afternoons and part of her evenings were spent with other schoolgirls working in factories, sewing military uniforms. The sudden change in the status at home was bewildering. My brothers in service, Fujiko working in a munitions factory, Hatsuyo in another factory. It was all so strange. Hatsuyo did not describe the enemy bombing in detail, even though it was the first time that our homeland had been attacked. Of course, we had received the news here at Ley much earlier, the same day, in fact. Officially, the government disclaimed any heavy damage, which seemed reasonable in view of the limited number of attacking planes. But the attack on Nerved almost every pilot at Lai, the knowledge that the enemy was strong enough to smash, that our homeland, even in what might be a punitive raid, was cause for serious apprehension of future and heavier attacks. I was still reading my mail when Warrant Officer Watam Handa approached me to request the loan of my wingman, Honda, for a reconnaissance flight to Port Moresby. Warrant Officer Handa was a new arrival at Ley, and a most welcome one. Although he had not yet fought in the Pacific, he was one of Japan's most famous aces from the China theatre, with 15 enemy planes to his credit. Since his return from the Asiatic mainland, he had served as a flight instructor at Tsuchiura. 
I saw no problem in letting Honda fly with him. Certainly, he would be with one of our best pilots. Honda, however, had other ideas about the matter. Veteran ace or not, he growled at my orders. I'd rather not go, Saburo, he mumbled. I have been flying only with you, and I don't want any changes now. Oh, shut up, you fool, I snapped. Honda is a better flyer than I am, and has been flying a lot longer, you go. At noon, Honda took off with five other Zeros for a reconnaissance flight over Moresby. I was disturbed at Honda's reluctance to fly the mission and sweated out his return. Two hours later, five Zeros came in for a landing. Warrant officer Honda's lead plane and four others. Honda's plane was missing. I ran all the way to the runway and climbed onto the wing of Warrant Officer Honda's Zero even before it stopped rolling. Where's Honda? I shouted. Where is he? What happened to him? Honda looked at me, misery on his face. Where is he? I screamed. What's happened? Honda climbed down from the cockpit. On the ground he took both my hands in his, bowed low, then spoke with an effort. His voice was choked. I... I am sorry, Saburo, he stammered. I am sorry, Honda. He, he is dead. It was my fault. I was stupefied. I couldn't believe it. Not Honda. He was the best wingman I'd ever flown with. Warrant Officer Honda turned his face away from me, staring at the ground, and began to trudge to the command post. I followed him, unable to speak, as he continued. We were over Moresby, he said in a low tone. We started to circle at 7,000 feet, the sky seemed clear of enemy planes, and I was searching the field for planes on the ground. It was my fault, all my fault, he murmured. I didn't even see the fighters. They were P-39s, I don't know how many, just a few of them. They came down so fast that we had no warning, we didn't even know they were on us until we heard them firing. I went over into a roll, as did Endo, my other wingman. When I turned around for a moment, I saw Honda's plane, which had been at the end of my trio, enveloped in flames. He drew the crossfire from the P-39s. I stopped and stared at him. Honda walked away. He never seemed to recover from the blow of having lost my wingman. Although he was an ace in China, warrant officer Honda had apparently lost his sure touch in the air. He had never fought the American fighters, which could outdive our planes by a considerable margin. Whatever had actually happened, Honda took personal blame for the death of my wingman. He was wan and pale for the remainder of his time at Ley. Finally, he contracted tuberculosis and was sent home. Many years later, I received a letter from his wife, she wrote. My husband died yesterday from his long illness. I am writing this letter to meet his last request that I write and apologise for him. He never recovered from the loss of your pilot at Ley. The last words he spoke before he died were, I have fought bravely all my life, but I cannot forgive myself for what I did at Ley when I lost Sakai's man. When he died, Honda was only twenty years old. He was a strong man, in his actions on the ground as well as in the air. He was quick to fight, but was one of the most popular men in the Sasai squadron. I was very proud of him. His wing flying had been superb. I was confident that he was on his way to becoming an ace. For the rest of the day, I wandered around the base in a daze. I paid no attention to the rest of the men in the squadron who pledged revenge for the first pilot lost from our group since April 17th. To me, my greatest accomplishment in air battle was the fact that I had never lost a wingman. And now I had sent out Honda against his own wishes to fly with another man, and he was dead. I could not help thinking that my other wingman, Yonikawa, might well be killed also. For long months, Yonikawa had faultlessly covered my fighter in the air. He had done so well by me that he was still without a single victory of his own. Honda had been more aggressive and had shot down several enemy planes. My mind was made up. Yonikawa must get his own victim on the following day, May 14th. I received naval aviation pilot Hattori as Honda's replacement. Before we took off in a flight of seven fighters for Moresby, I told Yonakawa that if we met enemy fighters, he would fly my position and I would cover him. Yonakawa's face lit up with excitement. If I had known what was in store for us that day, I would not have arranged things differently.
the Allied pilots, it appeared, had given serious study to the unexcelled manoeuvrability we enjoyed with the Zero Fighter. Tode marked their first attempt at new tactics. We saw the enemy planes over Morrisby, but, unlike their previous manoeuvres, they failed to form into a single large formation. Instead, the enemy planes formed in pairs and trios, and were all over the sky as we approached. Their movements were baffling. If we turned to the left, we'd be hit from above and the right, and so on. If they were trying to confuse us, they were achieving their purpose. There was only one thing to do, meet them on their own terms. I pulled up to Sasai's plane and signalled him that I would take the nearest pair of enemy fighters. He nodded, and as I pulled away, I saw him signalling the other four zeros into two pairs. We split into three separate groups and turned to meet the enemy. We rushed at the two P-39s I had selected, and I fired a burst at 100 yards. The first Aero Cobra evaded my shells and winged over into a screaming dive. I had no chance even to get near him for another burst. The second plane was already rolling over for a dive when I rolled hard over to the left, turned, and came out on his tail. For a moment I saw the pilot's startled face as he saw me coming in. The P-39 skidded along on its back, then whipped over again to the left in an attempt to dive. He looked good for Yonikawa, who was glued to my tail. I waved my hand in the cockpit and rolled to the right, leaving the P-39 for my wingman. Yonikawa went at the Ara Cobra like a madman, and I clung to his tail at a distance of 200 yards. The P-39 jerked wildly in a left roll to evade Yonikawa's fire, and Yonikawa took advantage of the bank and turned to narrow the distance between the two planes to about 50 yards. For the next few minutes, the two fighters tangled like wildcats, rolling, spiralling, looping, always losing altitude, with Yonikawa clinging grimly to the tail of the enemy plane and almost leaping out of the way whenever the P-39 turned on his zero. It was a mistake on the part of the enemy pilot to break his dive in the first place. He had every chance of getting away. But now, with Yonikawa so close to him, the dive would mean an open and clear shot for the zero. From 13,000 feet, the two planes with me right behind them dropped to only 3,000 feet. The enemy pilot, however, knew what he was doing. Unable to shake the zero after him, he led the fight back to the Moresby Air Base and thus within range of the anti-aircraft guns. It was by no means a one-sided battle, for the P-39 pilot manoeuvred brilliantly with an airplane which was outperformed by his pursuer. The Aero Cobra and Zero looked like whirling dervishes, both firing in short bursts and neither pilot scoring any major hits. Soon it became obvious that Yonakawa was slowly gaining the upper hand. On every turn he hung a second or two longer to the tail of the P-39, steadily gaining the advantage. The two planes passed over Moresby and continued their running battle over the thick jungle growth. Hattori pulled alongside my own fighter, and we gained altitude, circling slowly over the two battling planes. Now they were down to treetop level, where Yonikawa could use the Zero to its best advantage. The Aero Cobra no longer had airspace in which to roll or spiral, and could only break away in horizontal flight. As he swung out of a turn, Yonikawa was on him in a flash. There was no question of his accuracy this time. The P-39 dropped into the jungle and disappeared. Yonakawa had drawn his first blood. A torrential downpour on May 15th meant a day of rest for all pilots, but the respite was short, for before daybreak on the 16th several B-25s swarmed over the field at treetop level, digging craters in the runway and shooting up maintenance facilities. For the second day in a row we remained on the ground. It would take the entire day merely to fill in the holes and patch up the field, we sat around in the billets, several pilots catching up on sleep, while the rest of us discussed the rising tempo of the enemy attacks. A bomber pilot joined our group. He had landed at Ley for refuelling and was grounded after the attack and listened with interest to our descriptions of attacking the enemy bombers. After a while, he looked wistfully at the Zero fighters parked off the runway. You know, he said suddenly, I think my greatest ambition has been to fly a fighter. 
not these trucks we go around in. It's funny, he mused. We've been taking more and more punishment on our raids. Most of the men feel they'll never live to go home. I feel the same way. Yet, he turned to look at us. I would be satisfied if there was one thing I could do. We waited for him to continue. I'd like to loop that truck I fly, he added. He grinned. Can you picture that thing going around in a loop? One of the Zero pilots spoke up. If I were you, I wouldn't try it, he said softly. You'd never come out of a loop in one piece, even if you could get up and around into one. I suppose so, he replied. We watched him walk across the field and climb into the cockpit of a fighter, where he sat and studied the controls. At the time, we didn't know that all of us would remember this pilot for the rest of our lives. The day passed slowly, and that night Nishizawa, Ota and I went to the radio room to listen to the music hour which came over nightly on the Australian radio. Nishizawa suddenly spoke up. That music listen, isn't that the Dame Macabre, the dance of death? We nodded. Nishizawa was excited. That gives me an idea. You know the mission tomorrow, strafing at Moresby. Why don't we throw in a little dance of death of our own? What the devil are you talking about? Otter snapped. You sound like you've gone crazy. No, I mean it, Nishizawa protested. After we start home, let's slip back to Moresby, the three of us, and do a few demonstration loops right over the field. It should drive them crazy on the ground. It might be fun, Otter said cautiously. But what about the commander? He'd never let us go through with it, so, was the retort. Who says he must know about it? Nishizawa grinned broadly. We went off to the billet, and the three of us talked in whispers of our plans for the tomorrow. We had no fear about appearing over Moresby with only three fighters among the three of us. We'd shot down a total of sixty-five enemy planes. My tally was twenty-seven, Nishizawa had twenty, and Ota had accounted for eighteen.